started operating at about two levels at that time. My conscious was saying, all right, we're going to the target. My subconscious was telling me, it's over, Ron. You better start thinking about plan B here pretty soon. I realized at that point that uh, there was no more flying in this airplane. I was strictly a passenger. You train all of your career for this. You go through practice shots on the ground and everything else. You got the elbows in, the spinal column straight, and the head back, and squeeze the triggers, and that's the last thing I remembered. This thing of your entire life passing before your eyes in a matter of seconds really does happen. You think about your wife, your kids. What are they going to do without me? And there you are, floating down the parachute. The United States Air Force had seen fit to send me to survival school, to water survival school, to jungle survival school, all the training that I needed for escape and evasion. And I came through the trees and landed right in the middle of a small village. And I escaped and evaded for about five seconds. I looked over, and there's the rabbit over there, and the famous interrogator calling off our names. That was our last look at the rabbit. And as luck would have it, when I stepped across the line and stuck my hand out, there was an old friend there to greet me. I saluted and I kept a very stern military face and I refused to let myself smile until I rounded the corner and went up the ramp into the C-141, and then the smiles broke out, and then inside we were all hugging, and not hugging, but guys don't hug, <laughs> girls hug. But uh, we were all just, you know, shaking hands and talking with the Air Force personnel. Then it was quiet again as we took off. We rolled down the runway, and everybody's real silent. And as the wheels broke the ground, we just went into pandemonium. They almost tore the guts out of that airplane. You remember her says shouting and stomping going on. Here, our first significant proof that we were free. We're on an American airplane. We're airborne now.
had the opportunity to serve our country under difficult circumstances, we are profoundly grateful to our Commander-in-Chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. God bless America. We got off the bus. They said, does anybody have any medical problems that need to be taken care of right now? And I said, well, it's not real bad, but I've had a toothache for about five years. I was in the dental clinic in five minutes, and it was taken care of in another five minutes. It was, it was fantastic, the, the way they took care of us there. We had a clean, soft bed with white sheets on it. It was hard to sleep on. We'd been sleeping on concrete so long, it was too soft. We got a hot shower with real soap. And they had a stainless steel pitcher in every room with water in it with ice cubes. Now, you're looking at me like, this man is crazy. Let me tell you, that was like breaking the sound barrier. We were home. There was food, and there was dessert, and uh, there was uh, clean sheets, and there was soft music, and there was pretty nurses, and there was, oof, it was, uh, <laughs> it was really overpowering. <laughs> I walked into that chow hall at the hospital, and uh, the cook standing behind the counter there said, uh, what'll it be? And I said, I want a steak and a dozen fried eggs. And he fixed it right up for me. And I went and ate that, went back, and got seven more fried eggs. I had 19 fried eggs, my first meal at Clark.